1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Paul writes, Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Now, as I've mentioned, you know, what I do when I'm going through our study is I try to give you as much cross-reference and all to develop this Bible study, and that's what we'll be doing today today. So for those who take notes, I'll be giving quite a number of scriptures to you to develop what we're looking at so that you can see the biblical basis of the direction of the teaching. Now we begin by remembering that last week when we were together, we looked at the rapture. So today what we're looking at is that which follows the rapture. We're looking at a time in, uh, on the, uh, that will occur on the face of the earth that is referred to in various ways, but we know it as the tribulation. Now, the tribulation is a period of time that God pours out his wrath on unbelievers. Uh, somebody wrote that the tribulation is a future seven-year period when God will finish his discipline of Israel and finalize his judgment of the unbelieving world. The church made up of all who have trusted in Jesus to save them from being punished for sin will not be present because the church will be removed from the earth in the rapture. And so this is an event that takes place after the rapture, and, and it's referred to as the tribulation, but it's also referred to in the scriptures by different ways, in different ways. Uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, refers to it as the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel chapter 12 calls it the day of trouble. The great tribulation is mentioned in Matthew 24, 21, which speaks of the second half of the seven-year period. And the day of the Lord is a common phrase that you find in the Old Testament. The tribulation is the most clearly revealed in Revelation chapters 6 through 19. And in chapter 6, verses 16 and 17 in Revelation, uh, the tribulation is referred to as the, uh, the great day of wrath. It reads, they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So the tribulation is a period, seven years, where God pours out his wrath on, on unbelievers as well as finishes his discipline of the nation of Israel for rejecting Messiah. The church will not be going through the tribulation. Why is that? Because it is a time when God pours out his wrath on unbelievers. Christians will not experience this wrath. Why? We've been delivered from it. Now, we saw in chapter 1, verse 10, that uh, the Thessalonians were waiting for his son from heaven, whom the scripture says he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, when you look at your Old Testament, you'll see that God delivers the righteous out of the wrath of judgment. For example, he delivered the righteous while pouring out his wrath on the wicked during the time of Noah. The Bible says that when he brought the flood, he delivered Noah and his family from that judgment. When you read Genesis in chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, it states there that God had determined to judge wicked mankind, but Noah found grace in his sight. When God was judging Sodom and Gomorrah, remember how that Abraham questioned, questioned him concerning that. You see, Abraham's nephew Lot and his family were living in the area. And so when God had made it clear that judgment was coming, um, he asked the question, Abraham, Abraham asked the question, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? 
He asked that in Genesis 18, 23. And the answer that he received was, no, I will not. So as a result, Abraham's nephew Lot and Lot's daughters were delivered from the judgment. God, God delivered the righteous from the judgment that came. And so Paul is dealing with this question. Remember I told you last time we were together that the Thessalonian church was going through great, great uh, affliction and persecution. They were beginning to wonder, are we in the tribulation? And Paul answered that question by first pointing to the fact that there would be a, an event called the rapture where he removes the church. But he's going to be sharing now a little bit about the, day, the, the time of judgment that is about to come. And so because they're suffering, they're wondering, are we in the tribulation? And so Paul begins to explain this a bit further. So in verse 1, it says, Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you. And so beginning here in, in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul speaks concerning the times and the seasons. Now, all of this is going to require a little bit of development so we can get the flow of the passage. When he speaks concerning the times and the seasons, when he uses the word times, he's speaking of the space of time that passes until all is fulfilled up to the rapture. When he speaks concerning seasons, he's referring to the critical events that occur as we await the rapture. So times and seasons speak of the way that time is experienced. The times and the seasons. Now times, when you're thinking of how time is experienced, five minutes with someone that you love feels like a short time. But if you're underwater for five minutes, it's a long time. And so that's a way of ex expressing how, how time can be experienced. And so waiting for the rapture can produce anxiety because it seems like it's taking too long. And so because of this, Paul is writing about the times and the seasons. The seasons are the events that must first take place. And so concerning the times and seasons, he says, you have no need. You have no need that I should write you. In other words, you already know the conditions that will exist prior to the rapture of the church. This is something, Paul would say, that you have been thoroughly instructed about. And because of this, you should be in a state of anticipation, not anxiety. The church, in other words, shouldn't be in anxiety as we see the things that are going on around us because we know that those are fulfilling the conditions that the Lord Jesus Christ has declared would take place during this time. And so he's saying, you yourselves know perfectly, notice verse 2, uh, you, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. You know this accurately. The word perfectly speaks of something that is accurate or complete. So you know accurately, you know completely that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Now how could he say that? How can he say to this, this church, you know this well? How could he say that this with such confidence? Well, he had spent time teaching them about the events that would happen. When you look back in the book of Acts in chapter 17, it speaks of how the church had been planted. It tells us that Paul had reasoned in the synagogue for three Sabbaths, and it would seem that he had only spent a very short time there, maybe two, maybe three weeks, because reasoning in the synagogues, that only takes uh, three weeks to do that. So it may seem that he was there for a short time, but, but that's not exactly true because Paul mentions that he received financial support on two occasions while he was there, from Philippi. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, he says, You Philippians know also that from the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Now that tells me that he was there for a period of time. How's that? Well, Philippi was a hundred miles from Thessalonica. And they gave on more than one occasion. That tells us that he was there for a while, giving him ample time to minister the word to the uh, Thessalonians. He'd been there long enough to thoroughly teach them. And so as he's speaking, that's why he can say, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes. Now notice, as a thief in the night. And so he would have taught them concerning what he's referring to as the day of the Lord. And he would have taught them thoroughly what that means. Now, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is referred to quite often. For those who take notes, it's mentioned, the day of the Lord is mentioned around 20 times. 
And the Old Testament reveals to us what the day of the Lord is. Again, he says, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord. And so it, it explains to us in the Old Testament what it is. is a time when God pours out judgment, distress, and wrath during the period that is called in the New Testament the tribulation. Let me give you a couple of uh, examples in Scripture. Isaiah 13, 9 through 11. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and now it's described, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth. The moon will not cause its light to shine. And he goes on to say, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. So it's a time of wrath and fierce anger, laying the land desolate. Ezekiel 30, verse 3, the day of the Lord is near. It's a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Joel chapter 2, verse 2, it's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Joel 2, 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So it's a time where God is pouring out his wrath on those who have rejected Messiah. And so he says in verses 2 and 3, he says that, that you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So he's now beginning to describe what takes place during this time called the tribulation. Now, I want you to see this, and I'll develop this. He's distinguishing be, uh, between believers and unbelievers. He said, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief. He's speaking to believers. But in verse 3, he says, for when they say... So believers are prepared. It's the non-believers who are taken by surprise. That's why it's referred to as, as a thief in the night. It's not the believers who are taken by surprise. He's not referring to us. He's referring to those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord, he says, is coming as a thief in the night. It, it comes suddenly. It's a surprise to those who are not expecting Christ to come. They're not prepared. I've shared that. Uh, I've shared this before in the past, and I'll say it very briefly so I don't have to bore those who already have heard me share this. But I didn't know what he speaks, this kind of thing, this concept. I didn't know what it, what it would mean to be taken by surprise in the way that he's describing, a thief in the night. I didn't know what it was like to be taken by surprise. I wouldn't have known what he's referring to. But I found out in a very personal way when I was around 19 or 20 and the way I found that out is I wasn't saved. I was not saved at that age yet. I had gotten saved later on. But this happened before I was a Christian. And my parents would normally take their vacation in August. And my dad would normally take off for a few days. And this time, my dad and, and family, my dad, my mom, my two sisters, I stayed home. We were supposed to go up to Yosemite. They were supposed to be gone for three or four days. So they left. And the day after they left, I decided it was a good thing to have a party. So I invited friends who invited people I didn't know. And before you know it, my father's house, my dad's house, was filled with people I knew and strangers on top of that. And for two days, two solid days, we partied for two solid days. It's, you know, I wasn't saved, so there was, we were drinking, we were doing drugs, people were spilling their wine on my dad's brand new carpet. I mean, it was a, it was a bad thing. But I, I was so out of it for those two days that I, I wasn't aware of what was going on because I figured I had plenty of time before dad and mom came home. I, they wouldn't come home till, I thought, till Friday, and it was now only Tuesday when my sister Madeline, who had gone with my dad and my sister Becky, came running into the house. And I'm sitting at the kitchen table with a friend of mine who's extremely messed up. And Madeline runs in and says, Dad, we're home. Dad's home. And he's mad. And I, I was just like, oh, wow. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to see God, and I'm not ready. 
So I started pushing people literally out of the house, going and collecting them from the rooms. And I had 30 seconds to yell, get out, get out. The doors open. I had a guy, a friend of mine named Albert, who was very, very messed up at that time. And I took him and shoved him out the front door. And he's just wobbling around. And the next minute, within 10, 15 seconds, he walked to the side, came in the house again. I grabbed him and I threw him out twice. And, and so I'm there just standing there when my dad walks in. And there was blood in his eye, that old phrase. And he was mad and basically said, you better leave before you die. And I, I, obviously I left. And so I discovered what it means to be taken by surprise by an unexpected visitation. <laughs> and that's what's going to happen to the unbelieving world. The unbelieving world is going to be busy about its sinful business. And that's what Paul is talking about. He said, don't be taken as like a thief in the night. It's going to come as a surprise to those who are not waiting with expectation for the Lord. Now, Luke, in, uh, Luke, uh, Luke 12, 39 and 40, Jesus gave an example of this in those verses when Jesus said, understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So you have to be on the alert. You have to be prepared. You need to be ready to meet him. It's what he's saying in general. There will be people in the tribulation period who came to faith in Christ. They would be aware that they should be prepared. But the unbelievers... Uh, are going to be taken completely by surprise. Now, Jesus made it clear that a period of time would pass until that day came. It would be a prolonged time. So they were to be ready. In Matthew 13, 33 through 37, take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. Be on the alert. Now, what's going to be taking place? Well, notice it, he says... In verse 3, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. So when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. Notice the words they and them. Who is he referring to? He would be speaking of false prophets. It's the false prophets who are saying peace and safety. It's the false prophets who will be very much in control of the message at that time. And they are going to be preaching and preparing for Antichrist, and they're preaching a false peace during this tribulation. The rapture occurs. There's chaos in the world. A world leader arises, and he brings about a, a false type of peace. He has spokespeople. They're referred to as a false prophet prophets who go out and, and bring calmness to the world, preparing the, the world to accept this antichrist. In, in Matthew 24, verses 23 and 24, it, it reads, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if, if possible, even the elect. So there will be people saved during the tribulation. This is a warning to those people because even though false prophets are going forth, there are those who are preaching the true gospel. People will be saved. So he's warning the believers, but he's saying that there are false prophets and false Christs who are rising. And notice again, they're showing great signs and wonders to deceive. So the church is, is to be warning the world that peace only comes through Christ. And the world will be working for peace but it doesn't come. Peace does not come, never has and never will, through the world's efforts. So what happens is false prophets deceive the world into a false peace by giving to them or promising to them an outward security. 
Now, this is still for the future, but even at this time, there's already the spirit of the age that is preparing people to receive these things, to receive false teachers and to welcome a false Christ. That's already in the works right now. In a time of much anger, much division, in this time, in a time of senseless violence, the desire for peace is with us, and it will continue to increase until it is an overwhelming desire. What has happened today is the rejection of the Christian faith has been replaced with a spirituality. You can ask people, uh, are you a believer? And they'll say, I'm spiritual. They like to use the term, I'm spiritual. And so the Christian faith, uh, a faith that's built on fact, is uh, now being replaced by by a kind of a nebulous emotionalism as it pertains to the spiritual life. And, and in our day, uh, the rejection of Jesus Christ and rejection of the Bible is much more acceptable. In the, in the uh, recent Olympics, there was a surfer from Brazil who had a, a uh, portrait, you know, picture on his surfboard of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was not allowed to surf because they were offended by the fact that he had uh, a picture of Christ on the surfboard. And there was a, a tennis player. They said, you can't wear your cross because it's offensive. We're already dealing with that. It's already here. There is a rejection of that. There's a spirit of this age. It's okay to have a mockery of the Last Supper, but you can't have a cross, and you can't have an uh, artist's conception of Jesus on a surfboard. It's already here, and you have apologists who are making excuses for that mentality. Well, that's going to be the prevailing attitude after the rapture. Sin is accepted, biblical truth rejected, anxiety prevailing, hardening of hearts, a great rejection and a growing greater rejection of biblical truth, evil more in the open than ever, no longer being hidden, paraded, and celebrated, openly practiced. In Romans 132, that scripture speaks of those who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Christians rejected sinfulness, accepted, normalized, and celebrated. And so he says in verse 3, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. Now, how could such a thing ever happen, seeing that we've been warned? There are prevailing conditions that make it possible. Remember that even now, believers are under attack by the constant onslaught of evil. After the rapture, many will come to a saving faith in Christ and and many will be martyred. In Matthew chapter 24, 9 and 10, Jesus said it. He said, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. So he's letting us know what will take place. False prophets preaching error abound. They gain prominence. They gain a hearing. Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. They're going to be part of a false religious system that the scripture in Revelation 17 refers to as mystery Babylon. Now, a great number simply grow indifferent to the Christian message of love and truth. Jesus in Matthew 24, 12 said, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Later in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Paul says, let no one deceive you by any means. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin, Antichrist, is revealed, who's also referred to as the son of perdition. Now, with a world that is filled with tension, again, we have that world now, but it's going to be magnified. A leader who can bring peace is going to be welcomed by all. False prophets, a false gospel, will create a welcoming atmosphere for this one to show up on the scene called Antichrist. And people will believe in Antichrist 
through the false preaching as well as the miracles. Matthew 24, 24, false Christ and false prophets will arise, show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, the elect. Now remember, when you look in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 24, beginning at verse 1 and reading through, Jesus had pointed out this, the temple. He was leaving the temple surroundings there in Jerusalem. And he pointed to the, uh, the stones and all because his disciples said, look at the stones, look at this temple. Isn't this amazing? And the uh, ancient descriptions of the temple during the time of Christ uh, make it very clear that it was a, a glistening, beautiful building. Beautiful. And, and the Jewish people were very, very proud, if you will, of that amazing structure. And so his disciples pointed out and say, isn't that beautiful? And then Jesus speaks to them. He says, really, you think so? Well, I tell you that not one stone will be left upon another. It's all going to be destroyed. So that causes a question to come into the heart of the men. And, and so later on, they ask him a question. They said, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? When's this going to happen? But when they asked that in Matthew 24, 3, when they said, what will be the sign? I like to point your attention to the fact that that's singular. The sign, it doesn't say the signs. We, we live in a time when we like to speak concerning the signs of the times. And we speak about the, the pestilence and we speak about the wars, r rumors of wars, things of that nature. We speak of those things because you find that in Matthew 24. But the question wasn't asked, what about the signs? What are the, it was a singular what is the sign? What is the number one sign? What is the preeminent sign? What is the prominent sign? And Jesus said it very clearly in, in Matthew 24, verse 4. He said, take heed. Take heed. That speaks of my personal responsibility. Take heed that you were not deceived. Take heed that no one deceives you. What is the primary sign of the last days? Is it wars? Is it rumors of wars? Is it famines? Is it pestilence? What is it? Jesus said it clearly. Deception. Deception. False messages. The battle's for your mind. The battle is for your faith. These are other things that will happen as a result of no faith. The battle is for your faith. That's why he said, you take heed. You be aware. That's why Paul would say, you have been perfectly taught. I've given you the information that will save you and give you peace. And he said, take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed that no one seduces you, that no one leads you astray. And he didn't say it simply once. He repeated it in verse 11, and he repeated that again in verses 23 and 24. That is the sign Spiritual deception sown by false prophets and false teachers, the primary sign is openness to false teaching and spiritual deception that will be promulgated by false doct uh, doctrine, false teachers. Now, this openness to a false message has is, is always been within religious communities. It's been in the community of Israel from very much in its earliest days. It's not a new condition to be open to false, false doctrine. Or false teachers in the book of Jeremiah, a book of, uh, by the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 13, uh, through the prophet, God said, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They rejected me, the fountain of living water, hewn them out cisterns. In Israel, they, they relied on the water of, of rain. God said when he was bringing the nation of Israel into, into their promised land, he said, you will not be receiving water from a major water source like the Nile. In Egypt, you had the, the Nile, which you would use for your water source and for all the, the irrigation and everything else. But it's not so in Israel. You will rely on the rain because there is no major river. You have the Jordan River in Israel. It's a small river. In some places, you can almost just jump over it. It's that small. So what you're going to do is you're going to learn the grace of God, how I provide for you the early and the latter rain. You're going to rely on me to provide water for your crops and sustenance for your life. You're going to learn what grace is. And so what would Israel do? Well, because they go through hot seasons. They would hew out of rocks what are called cisterns, water reservoirs. And we've seen them many times, these 
these reservoirs that, that they would dig out a rock and, and they, the water would be caught, the rainwater, and it would fill up multiple thousands, hundred thousand plus gallons of water that could put, be put in these huge reservoirs. And the first time we went to Israel, the first time we went, Pastor Chuck took us to a place and gave us a study out of Jeremiah and he said, you see what you're standing near is a cistern that could hold X amount of water, 100,000 plus gallons. He says, but the problem with it is they would plaster the interior and because this was neglected, there were, a hairline fracture had developed in this cistern. So when they came and dropped their bucket to get the water, it was dry because it was a broken cistern. And so they dropped the water in times of thirst. They were unable to get any water because they had trusted in a broken cistern. And Jeremiah said, that's what you're doing. My people have forsaken me. They have committed two evils. They forsook me, the living water, the fountain of living water, hewed for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. That's what happens when you put your trust into false prophets' teachings. That's what happens. Jeremiah 5.31, the prophets prophesy lies. The priests, rules by their, the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love it this way. They love being lied to. The day will come when they will no longer endure healthy teaching, but who heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears will be turned aside from the truth and turned unto fables. That is what is taking place. In the days immediately preceding the rapture, apostasy has already begun developing. There will be a deliberate rejection of Christian doctrine. People will follow deception sown by demons, originators of all false religion. And the false beliefs are evangelized, with many willfully rejecting the Christian faith. I read a survey that was, uh, that was performed on, in January 24th of this year, and it, and it reads, when Americans are asked to check a box indicating their religious affiliation, 28% now check none. A new study from Pew Research finds that the religiously unaffiliated, a group comprised of atheists, agnostics, and those who say their religion is nothing in particular, is now the largest group sharing the same beliefs in the United States. They are more prevalent among American adults than Catholics, 23%, or Evangelical Protestants, 24%. 28% of those surveyed today are saying, that's one quarter of America, more than that, I don't have any religious affiliation. I have no belief system. I'm an agnostic. I'm an atheist. Or I just don't care. So we're seeing that in a time when over 90% used to say, I am a Christian. We're seeing a very slow but great diminishing of faith in the United States. That's a seed. That's a seed that will come to full maturity after the rapture. When the rapture occurs, the rejection of Jesus will occur, and the Antichrist will rule and give a false peace. He's a world re he'll be a world leader. He will be feared by all. And he will also demand worship. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 says that he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship. So that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Now part of how this occurs is with him who is going to be at first looked at as a man who produces peace. He will be brokering a, a peace treaty with Israel and the opposing nations. You see that in Daniel 9, 27. And that's going to produce what is called the tribulation. And in the middle of the tribulation, what he's going to do is he's going to betray these, the Jewish nation by, by putting an idol in the temple that will be rebuilt. It's found in Matthew 24, 15. It's called the abomination of desolation. Now, Revelation chapter 13, verses 14 and 15 reveals that those who do not worship the beast's image will be killed. And Antichrist will be reigning. And people will begin to live in a temporary peace. 
But it says in verse 3, sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Sudden destruction speaks of an unexpected ruin that can even include death. And it comes unexpectedly. Those ladies here who have gone through childbirth, you understand how unexpectedly that pain hits. I remember it very well with Marie. I remember when Marie was giving birth to our first firstborn, my Corinne. And I remember how Marie would suddenly wince and she, it, it, it was like it came out of nowhere. And, the, and she'd show this pain on her face and she expressed it and she'd go oh, like that. And I looked at her and, and I prayed. And I said, thank you, God, that I'm not a woman. <laughs> it's so good. Hallelujah. <laughs> but it came suddenly. It came unexpectedly. And that's what he's saying is going to happen. They're going to be caught by surprise. Why? Because they refused what God had said. It's like during the days of Noah when people were considering his warnings to be ridiculous. They didn't listen to the warnings. As a result, we're taken in judgment. Matthew 24, 37 through 39. As the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. What's going to happen is life as usual is going to go on. They've, they've, uh, they've yielded themselves to, to the, the Antichrist and all. The, there's peace and there's safety. And in the midst of that, sudden destruction comes upon them. But he goes on to say this to the, to the believer, you, in verse 4, you brethren are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So he's contrasting. You are not in darkness. You are in light. You see, those who are walking in darkness is simply another way of saying they, they are without the direction of God. They're living in darkness, in spiritual uh, darkness. Uh, darkness is the state of being unregenerate. It, it is a spiritual blindness. It's an ignorance, which is, by the way, the condition of all men by nature. And if the Holy Spirit is not in your life, there will be no spiritual illumination. We have been illuminated or made to see, or the light has come upon us when we get saved. And these others are living in darkness. And when they're in darkness, they're taken by surprise. They enter into judgment. But the believer isn't. Why? Because they've been taught. That's why in verse 5 he says, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. You are sons of light. You've been born again. You have no desire for that which is dark. We're not of the night, nor are we of darkness. Why? Because we live by the word of God. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Therefore, verse 6, let us not sleep as others do. Let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. We are to live expectantly. We're to be on the alert, disciplined in our way of life. Romans 13 tells us in verses 11 and 12, do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. He said in verse 7, those who sleep, sleep at night. Night is natural for sleep, and darkness is the natural environment for sin. But we are not of the night. We, he says, are of the day. So we don't give in to the anxieties of like unbelievers who are blinded by sin. What am I to do? Verse 8. He says, Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. What am I to do? Armor up. Be ready. Be sober. Stay alert. Be prepared. And be, pre be armed for battle. He speaks of putting on the breastplate of faith and love. The breastplate during that time, the Roman breastplate was to guard the internal organs. Let righteousness rule your spirit and your emotions. When he speaks of the helmet, speaks of it as the hope of salvation. Rest assured of God's merciful salvation. Resist the deception 
that is taking place. God help us. Because the church even today is being prepared. There are so many who go, and I don't mean this in a self-righteous, arrogant way. I know how some of the visitors here or those watching online who don't know our ministry might think this. But I, I can tell you, as somebody who's been ministering the Word for over 50 years, I can tell you that there are many churches that are called Christian who don't, they don't teach the Word there. And the people show up, and they're getting the pastor's opinions and the latest cultural manifestations, and they're not getting a line-upon-line line teaching of the Word to be prepared and to be, to be uh, inoculated against deception. I can tell you that's a fact. It's true. We have to put on the helmet, the helmet, the hope of salvation. We are assured of God's salvation, and, and we have been instructed so we could resist the deception. God didn't appoint us, verse 9, to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. God did not appoint us to wrath. We will not be judged with the unbeliever. We will not suffer his wrath. God does bring judgment, but it is on those who reject him. But he's telling the Thessalonians, you need not fear. You're believers. You've been well instructed. You have trusted the Lord. And he's already said in chapter 4, verse 17, the second portion, when he said, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We shall always be with the Lord. He's already given them encouragement. The Bible in Romans 1.18 says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Again in Romans 5, verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And so we know that he died for us, verse 10, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. We will be with him whether we live or die before he comes. Because he is our life. He is our life. Christ who is my life, Paul said to the Philippians. He's not just a way to life. He's not a way of life. He is my life. I abide in him. And he has given me life. And because that is true, we will be with him. He is our life. Therefore, what are we to do? Verse 11 Comfort each other, edify one another. Comfort and edify. Encourage people. Hold fast in the midst of what you're going through. Keep looking up for the Lord. Is go you're going to be with the Lord one way or another. You're not in the tribulation. You're not going through the tribulation, but you are going through affliction. Hold fast. Comfort one another. Edify one another. Like it says finally in Hebrews Chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards loving good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I think that COVID, when it hit a few years ago, it really shook up the church. And many of us, many of the, the church, because there were so many things going on, and the church was was not able to meet for a while as we tried to, tried to sort these things out and ultimately, ultimately began meeting again in the way we should have. That some, unfortunately, got caught up with the routine of not going into fellowship and staying home. And I still am meeting people. I just last week was speaking to somebody who said, I haven't been in, in church, live church now since COVID. Four years. I finally said, I need, I need to be with other people. You, you can go to baseball games and you can go to various uh, things and there are people, but I haven't been in church. Well, you know, we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. Why? Because within the church, we, we love one another. We pray for one another. We encourage one another. We provoke one another. We, 
we, we have fellowship with one another. We are able to minister to one another. We serve together. It, it, it's, a, it's a one another proposition when you're saved. And in the midst of the affliction and the difficulty and the fears that Thessalonians were having, Paul, as he taught about the rapture, taught about tribulation, the day of the Lord, he says, you need to hang together and comfort one another, build one another up. You need to do that because there's still a lot of work to be done. Don't be afraid. Keep looking up. Your redemption draws nigh. Occupy till he comes. And watch what will happen as God uses you in these last days. And so church, he's saying, don't be nervous. Christ is with you. He'll deliver you. Hold fast to him.